Well, I'm Chavrim. I'm Stephen Benoom. You're watching Israeli News Live. Today, once again, we have Dr. Stephen Pigeon here with us uh, on the program because there's so much happening uh, over in the Middle East. There's so much talk about the Gog of Magog War, uh, as we see in Ezekiel 38. Uh, we see the Russia phobia that is just really rampant across the world there, and yet. Uh, case after case after case is being disproven, especially the Skripal case uh, against the uh, Russian government that was blamed on uh, Russian government by Theresa May of uh, uh, Great Britain. And now uh, that has completely collapsed. There has been no evidence. Their own scientific company uh, that was trying to prove the case against Russia has come out and said that uh, they can't say that Russia actually did it. And so, you know, Steve, but because of all these things that we're seeing, we are having more and more people are really expecting a Gog of Magog war. And I know we touched on this a little bit a couple of weeks ago, uh, but I wanted to really break this down. So we brought, we, we discussed this before on Israeli News Live, uh, who really is Gog of Magog? Is Russia uh, a part of this or are they not? You know, and what what does it look like as we see these things unfolding right now, Steve? What's your take on this? Well, you know, I think there's a, a giant error, really, that uh, kind of uh, derived from Hal Lindsey's approach uh, to an ancient uh, English translation of this Ezekiel 38 passage, because it used to say, you know, Rosh, the Rosh Prince of Tubal and Meshech. And of course, the Hebrew Rosh means head, of course or chief, and we, we translate it in the Sefer as uh, the chief prince of Tubal and Meshech. Because Rosh, you know, it's so difficult to, to claim that this is a uh, exegesis or an exegetical understanding of scripture to say, well, Rosh sounds like Russia, therefore it must be Russia. Uh, you know, it's just not good exegesis. I mean, you have, there, yes, there are times for inductive reasoning to determine particularly where the tribes are, but uh, that kind of extrapolation, or that Tubal meant Tobolsk, uh, Meshek meant Moscow. I mean, there are Meshek Turks right now living in Turkey. There are the, the tribe of Tubalini, which is in uh, the far eastern, northeastern portion of Turkey and into Georgia. Those tribes exist, Meshek and Tubal. And <clears throat> if you read in the KJV, you read about one of the sons of Yafet is called Tiris, Tiris in the KJV, but it's actually better pronounced Thrace, Thrace, because of the Tav having a TH sound rather than a, than a Ta sound, Thrace. And Thrace, we know, is a region of Greece, you know, the area of, uh, that used to be called Macedonia, Thrace. And so you have this Yaban or Javan, a son of Yafet, Gimer or Gomer, Magog or Magog, Madai, all of these are sons of Yafet. But who is this Gog character? <clears throat> now, we're going to explore that just a little bit because with Gog, there is a history here, and it's a very interesting history. Because if you go into uh, Divrei Hayamim Rishon, First Chronicles, and you start looking at, uh, of course, First Chronicles is the, is the place where you can just knock yourself out. If you ever need some reading that's going to put you to sleep, that's it, you know. And so and so had these sons, and these sons had that son who begat this guy, who the following sons were blah, blah, blah. But when you're doing this research, Looking at those names becomes very, very important because you can get tribal history and you can get from that tribal history, you can get an understanding of who's who. Now, in First Chronicles chapter 4, beginning in verse 24, we begin talking about the tribe of Shimon. Now, the tribe of Shimon is very interesting because the land grant to Shimon was the Negev, right? It was, a, it was that southern portion, that southernmost most, uh, portion of of the land grant of the Adama Kodesh. And Shimon, because of that, they talk about uh, the sons of the south or the Sepharad, the Sepharad. But the Sepharad, again, if we if we, we would say Sepharad, but it, oftentimes in the Hebrew, you would lose that initial consonant. Instead of Sepharad, you'd say Sephrad, Sephrad. But if the pe there was not a ph, but rather a pa, Sprad, Sprad, right? Sprada, Sparta, Sparta. Sephirad, I believe, leads to leads to the sons of Shimon, 
being the Spartans. That's one place. Another son of Shimon was, of course, Yemen. Yemen. And Yemen, of course, was, I believe, one time considered part of the Adam HaKodesh. And you have, so you have the sons of Shimon living in Yemen. But here in Chronicles, it's talking about the sons of Shimon. And it talks about the youngest son, who was Shemai. Shemai. And these, uh, Shemai and his villages, Shemai had 16 sons, all of whom had villages. And they were all unto Baal. They were all Baal worshippers, these sons of Shemai. One of his sons was Joel. His youngest son was Joel. Now, Joel went out and found large pasture, and he dwelt near Mount Sair. Mount Sair. But the sons of Joel were Shemaiah and Gog. Gog. And so this son of Joel was Gog. This is in found in 1 Chronicles 5, 4. And Gog had a son whose name was Bera. Bera. Now, Bera was carried away captive by the Assyrians. Now, that's very important because Bera ended up becoming a prince over the children of Reuben. Became a, chin, a prince over the children of Reuben. Now, there's something very interesting about the children of Reuben. Because one of Reuben's sons was a, was a man named Carmi. Carmi. And Carmi was taken captive again <clears throat> during the same period by Togath Pilsner. Or Pilmaser. And when they were taken captive, Carmi went out, was taken east, and was taken out to the east of the Euphrates. And they were warriors, and they started a, a city there. That city to this day is known as Kermansha. Kermansha. It's about, uh, uh, it's in the golden mean between Baghdad and Tehran. So it's about 160 miles uh, north northeast, or north east northeast of Baghdad. Okay. Well, Kerman was identified by Josephus as Germani. Not Kermani, but Germani. And they were a warrior tribe, and they were there, they were in this Kerman Shah, and they were basically kind of a front troops to resist an initial attacking army, as was the tribe of Manasseh in the land of Bashan, you know, Aga Bashan. <clears throat> and that land of Bashan, of course, included what is now Damascus. That was Bashan. And this was the land that was held by Manasseh initially. But Manasseh was also taken to the east of the Euphrates. But what about the Reubenites? What about the tribe of God? They weren't taken east of the Euphrates. They were taken north. Now, these Reubenites were kind of dropped off in the Anatolian Peninsula, what we call Turkey. But God, on the other hand, was taken over the river Sabat to Rome, which is now the Bosporus, into what we call uh, the, the Balkans. And from there, they became the Visigoths and the Ostrogoths, and they would come to burn Rome. And they would eventually end up in Spain and even in Morocco, and they became known as the Vandals when they were in Morocco and Tunisia and Libya, the Vandals. And they also burned Rome. And uh, finally, they would settle down as the Carthaginians, the Carthaginians. <laughs> But when you look at this Gog now, this son of Joel, this family is going to end up in central Turkey. That's where they're going to be displaced. Of Their ultimate displacement puts them in central Turkey. Okay, <clears throat> now, when we talk about Magog, we can have two, we've got two things going there. Is Ezekiel talking about Magog, the son of Yafet? Or is this a term of art? Gog and those from Gog, Magog. And it could be, it could be either one. It could, it, it's probably both. Right. It, now, it, yeah, because of the uh, the mailman there, which uh, if we say from in Hebrew, normally we say mean, but it could be, you could have a, it could just be the way it's pronounced there. But, you know, uh, mean Gog or Magog, either which way. So, yeah, you could have from Gog as, as a possibility. Yeah, so now when we look at that, now now the next question is, is Russia Gog and Magog? Are they involved in this in, in, in any meaningful respect? Well, the history of Russia is different than that. I mean, the, who are these Russians? And these Russians are a combination, really, of two people groups. You have uh, the, the Scandinavian Norsemen, you know, Finland, Swedes, 
uh, Finns and Swedes primarily, who joined together with uh, the Mongol tribes out of, out of East Asia. Well, the Mongol tribes, the spreading of the Mongol tribes were actually the fierce tribes of Menasha. Menasha was the fiercest tribe, really, of the House of Israel. They were fierce warriors. That's why they were up in Bashan. They were there to protect all of Israel from coming uh, invading armies. But they could not protect against Assyria, who had developed a compound bow, the most powerful bow, really, in human history. Its firepower was only exceeded in World War I. And the Assyrians were able to, once the Assyrians were able to conquer the half tribe of Menasha, the, the eastern tribe of Menasha, then really the northern kingdom was free picking. And it was only the hand of Yah that prevented the southern kingdom from falling to the Assyrians as well. It was the angels who slugged the 85,000 that night. And so what you see is that Menasha was taken east of the Euphrates. Menasha was actually taken to the east of the Caspian Sea. And as it went out east of the Caspian Sea, the tribe flourished and bloomed. And Menasha came to occupy Afghanistan. And it came to occupy, you know, outside of Pakistan. It was uh, up the northern end of that river valley, the Indus River Valley. And they became very populous and they continued to migrate. And in Fourth Ezra that we have in the Ed Sefer, you read that the ten tribes continued to travel to this land of Artsareth in order to practice the Torah that they had not practiced in the land. They went to a place where no one had dwelled before. Well, a lot of that was foot traffic. They went through, of course, Eastern Asia, through Mongolia, uh, through parts of China, parts of Siberia. They crossed over the so-called land bridge. Well, you don't need to cross on the land bridge. You can cross on the frozen ice in the middle of the winter. You don't need land to do it. And and so they ended up migrating into North America. So you see that this tribe of Menashe in Afghanistan, the very tribe that would kill Alexander the Great, would become the tribes of Genghis Khan. And also those tribes migrating into America would become the Athabascans, the Klingits, the Arapaho, the Navajo, the Apache, all uh, derived from this tribe of Menashe. Now this tribe of Menashe now is going to join with these Scandinavian tribes. Well, who are these Scandinavian tribes? The Scandinavian tribes, you know, were, Scandinavia was populated pretty late in the game. You're talking about the three, four hundreds A.D. Why? Because Scandinavia was covered with ice. In fact, most of Europe was covered with ice because of the long ice age. And there was a global warming period that happened in the third century A.D. Significant. It was 11 degrees centigrade warmer then than it is now. I mean, that's when you're talking about serious global warming where India, the Indus River Valley would see 145 degrees every summer. And this is where most of the tribes were, were living, and they were under kings called Gondo Pharez. Now, Pharez, of course, being the son of Judah, the kings over the tribes that were in the Indus River Valley had to be able to prove their lineage back to Pharez, the son of Judah. Remember that Mashiach comes from the tribe of Pharez, the son of Judah. And so these kings would have to demonstrate they were Gondo Pharez, they were of the house of Pharez. And they governed the 12 tribes, and the 12 tribes, really all the 12 tribes of Israel were present in the Indus River Valley, including the Levites. The Levites were there. And in the third century, they began migrating north over the Caucasus Mountains, and they migrated into what would become the Khazarian Empire. But the migration didn't stop because Europe was melting. And so the tribes continued to migrate. And so uh, Yair ben Davidi and Stephen M. Collins believed that it was the House of Issachar that moved into Finland and into Switzerland. But we also see that the House of Judah was present in Norway and in Sweden because you see evidence of the rampant golden lion, the rampant golden lion. When you see the rampant golden lion, that's evidence of the House of Ferez. When you see the rampant red lion, that's evidence of the house of the Sephardim or the house of Zara. And so you see the red lion coming up through Morocco and through Spain, but the golden lion coming actually through uh, the Nordic tribes. So these Nordic tribes, Issaquah, uh, Issachar, Judah, Dan, and Dan was always seafaring and always warring, came and began to merge with the Mongolian tribes and they merged in this northern part of Russia, and their, their capital was called Vladimir, Vladimir. 
and they would live in the northern part of Russia while the Mongols controlled the southern part of Russia. I mean, Genghis Khan conquered, you know, came close to conquering all of Europe. And so you had the Mongols ruling, and the Mongols were ruthless, brutal fighters. They would come with, in with an overwhelming tide to destroy. They completely defeated the uh, Crusaders in eastern Poland. Completely defeated them. The Knights Templar destroyed. If it hadn't been for the fact that the Khan had died and they all had to return to Mongolia or to China to see who would be the next Khan, uh, they would have continued to, go, to conquer Europe. But it didn't happen. Now, once they began their retreat, eventually the Russians would take Astrakhan, which was the capital of, of the uh, empire there on the Caspian Sea, and would establish Moscow and the Kremlin there, and would take the Kievan Rus in Kiev, uh, Ukraine, to establish Russia. So you see that they have no ties whatsoever to Gog and Magog. The, the, the closer ties, I mean, if, if there's any European that has a tie to Gog and Magog, it's Germany, the Karmani, the Germans, right? <clears throat> That's the one I'm interested <clears throat> in because you know what's interesting, Steve, when you talk about the Germani, as you brought up earlier, uh, you can also, too, see a connection where Rome gets involved because uh, the SS itself uh, in I forget exactly how that ties in. I'm sure you're more versed on that than I am, but that that was uh, the SS were very loyal. Uh, the, the the very insignia of the SS uh, is tied back into the Vatican itself as loyal fighters for Rome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and of course all of the uh, the Roman connection. Again, remember that Martin Luther, when he began his Reformation. He was excommunicated by the church, but in his mind, he never left the church. And so the, the, the Lutheran faith to this day has most of its trappings are Roman Catholic. He just believed that he was a reformer to the Catholic church trying to end, end bad practices, you know, some 98 bad practices. And, and he was accurate in his criticism. Uh, however, in his mind, he was never excommunicated. It's like the Episcopalian church was pushed out by Rome. But they, in their mind, they'd never left uh, the Holy Apostolic and Catholic Church, as they say in the Nicene Creed. And so you see that fierce loyalty. I mean, when the Holy Roman Empire was formed, they, you know, this is the second Rome, the second Reich. Uh, you know, historians will tell you that the Holy Roman Empire was neither holy nor Roman. I mean, it was German, it was a German empire, and it wasn't holy, I mean, it was an evil empire. <clears throat> but they called it the Holy Roman Empire, known as the Second Reich. They're, the Russians believed that the Byzantine Empire was the Second Rome and lasted until 1453, and that the Third Rome was actually Russia, who had inherited the crown from the last king of the, of the Byzantine Empire and was transferred to the Tsar of Russia. So you have a lot of people competing for this instance. However, we talk about the War of Gog and Magog. Now, there's an interesting, ha interesting thing happening, which is that Turkey just ordered and is demanding immediate delivery of S-400 systems. And I find this interesting, and that there's discussion now between Turkey, Iran, and Russia concerning resolving the situation in Syria. Now, let's look from a realistic point of view what's happening in Syria. Russia has defended its position in Syria and has defended the regime of Bashar al-Assad, primarily because Russia intends to keep its port at Latakia. And they intend to keep their long-term ally, which is Damascus. And you see Russia doing something here that gives a huge message to the rest of the world. We committed to this alliance years ago as the Soviet Union, and we're not going to break that alliance now, even when this guy is in desperation, even when we're facing ultimate confrontation with all the world powers, we're not going to break this alliance. Compare that to America, who will sell its friends down the river in a heartbeat. Sell them down the river, particularly if we find out they have some gold or some oil that we can steal. Then we sell them down the river and steal it, right? So you have somebody who has made a point of showing loyalty and allegiance and alliance to their allies and another group that hasn't. That gains credibility in the world. And, you know, power is about credibility. And so, but what happened is Turkey moved into Syria. You know, they came in there with the purposes of defeating this Kurdish army that 
the DOD, in its rogue discussions, said, yeah, we're going to put together a 30,000-man army right now, and we're going to create Kurdistan. Well, you know, as we were talking before the show, you know, you keep announcing what you're going to do, people are going to take steps to counter it. If you're going to do it, you know, it's like a, uh, the ugly said in the movie, The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly, when it's sitting in the bathtub. The guy breaks in the door, you, I've wanted to kill you since the day you took me out, blah, 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 blah. And so the ugly just shoots him out of the soap suds. And he says, you know, if you're going to shoot, shoot, don't talk, right? <laughs> <laughs> and this, and this, 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 it's the same thing going on here. If you're going to form a 30,000-man army, well, then do it. Don't tell the whole world you're going to do it. <clears throat> but anyway, they, told, they did tell the whole world. Turkey came in and said, well, we're not going to tolerate it. They just came right over the border with tanks. And so when they did that, now you have a Turkish invasion of Syria, and you have a serious invasion going on here. Yes. And the Turks, you know, the Turks have moved into Idlib and all that area, and they're talking about, we're going to remain here. We're going to stay. We're going to create a new boundary here. <clears throat> and, of course, that is a violation of international law. Uh, but Iran also has troops in Syria. So, yeah, uh, Russia has a vested interest in coming in and saying, no, look, we have told the whole world that we're going to restore the Syrian Republic uh, back to its original boundaries with all invading armies out of the country. So, of course, Russia is going to sit down with Turkey and Iran. They're going to sit down with them and say, okay, look, the United States is pulling out. You need to get out, too. We'll give you S-400 systems, or we'll sell them to you, to Turkey. We'll sell more S-400s to Iran. But why would you need S-400s, Stephen? Why does Turkey want S-400s? Who are they trying to protect against? And the answer, there's only one answer, and that's Israel. That's the answer. That's who they're trying to protect against. Because they know all the other defenses they have, including NATO-supplied arms, are ineffective against the stealth uh, mechanisms that the Israelis have deployed in their fighters. But the Syrians have demonstrated they can take down an Israeli F-15 with the S-400, and they did, in fact, do so. Yes. So, uh, so Turkey now says, well, we've got to have the S-400 then. All right. But is this Gog and Magog um, arriving? And the answer is, and we talked about this in the show before, that Gog and Magog I believe, are the 57 nations that are now being commanded by the caliphate out of Istanbul and the self-proclaimed caliph, Tayyip Erdogan. All right. Now, in light of that, how do you think Rome fits into this with uh, the Erdogan going to the Pope of Rome? And, of course, them both seeing, uh, as, they, as the Pope of Rome put it, that he actually says that they are... Uh, they have one thing they agree upon, and that's Jerusalem, because we know that, uh, as you said, you mentioned the 57 uh, Islamic nations. He's, Erdogan is trying to get them to join together to take uh, Jerusalem to keep the, the Israelis from uh, being able to take Jerusalem as their capital. But yet at the same time, we also know that uh, under the UN Resolution 181, as well as under the secret deal that Trump was working on that kind of got leaked out, it still shows shows the old city going to the Pope of Rome uh, under a, well, they, in, in Trump's message, it doesn't show it going to the Vatican, but it shows that it would be a United Nations force that would get, be the guaranteed statue for the old city, with the city being divided, part going to the Palestinians, part going to the Israelis. Uh, how do you think that plays in when it comes to uh, the Vatican's role in this and Turkey's role in this as uh, the Gog of Magog? Yeah, I think that, uh, you know, I think you have both of them are playing each other. Erdogan is playing the Pope and the Pope, the Pope is playing Erdogan. And they both think that they're going to get uh, the power seat. And I think the chances are very high that Erdogan is going to win at that game. Remember that the UN troops are, the UN recognizes one lawful religion, Catholicism. Yes. And those UN troops are really at the beck and call of the Pope. They're at the beck and call of the Pope. The white helmets, the so-called white helmets, are at the beck and call of the Pope. For the most part, they're symbolic, but they can exact death when he wants them to. And so, yeah, they're going to be, you know, when, when Trump came out and said, I'm going to put the Capitol in Jerusalem, extremely prophetic event, a Cyrus event, if you will. But as soon as you open that door, oh, Jerusalem's on the table. Okay, everybody go for it. Let's go. Now that Jerusalem's on the table, let's all go for it. 
And so they're all going for it. And Turkey is in the better position, but in order for Turkey to do it, it has to come through Syria. So I don't expect to see Turkey allied with Russia for a long period of time. Turkey is uh, not a loyal country. They're loyal to Islam. They are not loyal to anything else. And I don't expect to see a Turkey-Russia alliance last for very long. Then the Pope knows that Russia presents a significant problem because, of course, of their orthodoxy, which is anathema to the Catholic Church. And, of course, the freedom and the Protestant roots of America are also anathema to the Pope. So the Pope has been doing everything he possibly can to get a war going between America and Russia. And the question is, will he succeed? I don't know. I mean, right now, it's abated. And I can tell you that there's really no reason for Russia to attack America now, because guess what? We're about to go face first on the pavement with a financial wipeout that's going to render us a powerless tiger anyway. We're going to be a paper tiger. We're not going to be able to have, I mean, you can't, you know, when you go back to World War II, when, when the Japanese attack happened at Pearl Harbor, okay, they took down most of the Pacific fleet, but we were the industrial and manufacturing superpower of the world at that time. We had all of our own iron, you know, our iron and steel mills going. We were able to produce our own, uh, you know, coal, our own oil. We had, we had our own rubber manufacturing. We had all our auto manufacturing plants. We were able to gear up and, you know, industrialize very quickly, much more than the Germans even, and much more than uh, than the Japanese. I mean, the German Panzer tanks had Ford engines in them, for heaven's sakes. You know, so we were prepared to be able to go into mass production very quickly and become an industrial superpower. Now in this next war, we don't have any industry at all. We don't have any manufacturing. We're a McDonald's nation. Hey, it used to be what, what was good for GMC was good for America. Now it's what's good for you know uh, 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 what's good for McDonald's is good for America. You know, and so as a result, I mean, we have we really have slid into third world status and manufacturing bases in China and India now. Now China, and, China, all of our manufacturing other than Mexico is in China. So we have made uh, China to become a new industrial revolution to begin with. And therefore, I see China becoming a world power, uh, especially if, if for some reason the U U.S. and Russia were to get into any type of conflict. Uh, I know that right now, Steve, there is uh, talks uh, or, or a hinting of uh, North Korea firing off a um, a satellite, which some analysts are believing are, is going to be a violation and that the U.S. may uh, jump on that as a reason to launch a strike on North Korea after all. And that would probably be the only thing they could do to try to save the economy from a total collapse for a short period of time. Um, but also going back, though, before we get into that issue, let me ask you this. When we speak about Germany as being part of uh, this whole Gog of Magog, this group that uh, made up the, the, this, uh, this empire at that time, and that being uh, descendants of modern-day Germany, do you think that modern-day Germany could very well possibly join into an alliance uh, in the near future with Turkey uh, and even possibly some of the other uh, European Union uh, states joining with Turkey to go against Israel, uh, especially in light of the fact that there are so many Sunni uh, Muslims that have been transplanted into this region of the world. Yeah, I think that's a high possibility, actually. You know, one time when I was traveling through, I was traveling through Munich, and uh, I wanted to go into downtown Munich and, you know, see a little of the German culture. Well, you know, if you get down to Marienstrasse, okay, yeah, you can see German culture. But the instant you leave the very central downtown of Munich, you know, it's an Islamic city. It's a Turkish city. And the people who live there are all, are, you know, the, the vast majority of them are Turks, at least in the inner city. And so what you see in Germany is, and there was a natural alliance between Germany and Turkey uh, during World War I and World War II. And, and the remnant of the Ottoman Empire embraced, was very quick to embrace the, the Third Reich. What you see in the EU now is leadership that are all descendants of the Third Reich. And the EU leadership, you know, you and I did a video on this, it got translated into German. And of course, the first one to exploit the video was Erdogan. You know, calling the EU the Fourth Reich, right? 
But the EU does have all the trappings of the Fourth Reich, as does the Vatican. I mean, the Vatican appointed the head of the Knights of Columbus, who is a direct descendant of one of the most ruthless killers of the Third Reich. So, you know, you see these descendants of the Reich taking positions that are appointed positions. They're not elected positions inside the EU. They control the EU and they are pushing the EU along protocols that were consistent with the governing policies of the Third Reich. You don't have the ferocious racialism that was being preached by Hitler at that time. You don't have the voracious anti-Semitism that was coming out of the group at that time. Uh, and you don't have the ferocious nationalism because they're internationalists now. Internationalists, not nationalists. And so you do, but, but nonetheless, you have this neo-Nazi, if you will, protocol. That's why the EU is so ready to embrace the illegal regime in Ukraine, who is conspicuously neo-Nazi. I mean, the first move of that Ukrainian government was to require the Jews to register. And then you wonder why the, the, the Russian Jews in Crimea were begging for Putin to come into the Crimean Peninsula and to prevent the Holocaust that would have happened. And, you know, that tension between the Western Ukrainians and their tendencies to be neo-Nazis and the Eastern Ukrainians, many of whom are Russians and Russian Jews, it's a huge tension. It's always been present. It was present during the Soviet Union. It was present during World War II. And it's present again now. So the chances of a German-controlled EU gaining, uh, putting into alliance with Turkey, Gog and Magog, I think you, yeah, I think that's a very strong possibility, especially if you see the United States fade from the picture as a superpower as being any meaningful political broker, and the real power becomes Russia as a military superpower and a resource provider, China as an industrial and manufacturing power, where does that leave Europe? Where does that leave Europe? Well, you know, Steve, as uh, we talked about this before as well, um, they, in fact, myself and Jana were both in uh, um, Slovakia when, uh, when they were having the meeting of the foreign ministers that were discussing about creating the, the um, what were they calling it, the, the, the New World Army or something to that effect there, the European Union was putting together to basically replace NATO. Uh, now that has developed even more so since then, and now they have put Germany as the uh, the commander of this uh, army that they've been putting together for a European Union, as they call it, a rapid force response army. And so we are starting to see uh, this new neo-Nazi, so to speak, type of uh, union being put together here once again. And, and but what's even more uh, concerning is that there is so much, um, so much of the Islamic world that that really idolized Hitler to begin with, and now that we have them, uh, we have a, a large number. They call it refugees. I I can't say it's refugees, though, Steve, because uh, we've got a friend of ours. Uh, in the Netherlands that have gone out and interviewed uh, these so-called refugees and was really alarmed at how many men said, we didn't come here because of refugee status. We came here because we were told there was free money, there was women, and that's why we came. Uh, so right. very a concerning situation. I mean, you do have a small minority that are refugees that come here because of a war-torn situation in Syria, um, but the majority of them, especially from Africa, have been sent here, and one person shared with me not too long ago, they said that this is actually going to be who will serve in this new army that the European Union is putting together, and you were the one, Steve, that actually told me that Obama uh, sold this military equipment to the European Union. I believe that was you, Steve, that actually said that to me, that this was not equipment that was being brought over here because of... Uh, uh, the goodwill of the United States to protect uh, under a NATO alliance the Europeans from the Russians, but rather this equipment was being sold to the European Union for their new military. That's right, and whereas we would have never done that before because, of course, we're an occupying nation in Europe following World War II. We occupied Europe in order to prevent World War III under the same terms as World War I and World War II. That's why Germany was divided for so many years, because the assumption between Russia and America was 
if we divide Germany and keep them apart from each other, they won't become a war machine again. And of course, the Germans are quite good at war. They have, you know, extreme experience in military leadership. <clears throat> you know, and when it comes to European uh, European armies, the Germans are by, far, are by far the best until they meet the blunt instrument of the Russians, right? And the Russians have secured the largest land mass in the world for a reason, because they know how to do that. That's one of their skill sets. And so you see, but yeah. It, there, the idea here is to bring in, remember that the population crisis in Europe has been significant. I mean, you have uh, the Germans, the French, the Italians, everybody has a birth rate that is abysmal. And all of those nations are just going to depopulate themselves right off the face of the earth. I mean, when you've got a birth rate of 1.1 and you need a birth rate of 2.3 to continue at your same population rate, you're in a complete and irreversible population catastrophe, a demographic catastrophe. And so that's been the case for many years now. So the Germans said, and the EU leadership said, let's import. Who? Well, who did they import? They imported men of military age. Look at those refugees. They're men of military age. Well, what are we going to do with it? Well, we can put you over here in these concentration camps. we got a new one going up at you know Auschwitz. Or you can put on this uniform, swear allegiance to the EU, we'll pay you and will integrate you into the community. Now you've got a, a fierce fighting force full of young men, uh, and of course the leadership who do, do not believe in, in a creator, they're secular, profane people. They don't care if you're Muslim or not. You know, you're know, you gonna take orders from us, so they could care less. So they bring in this Muslim fighting force, yeah, and, and in a very short period of time, you know, as they refer to it in, uh, the, in the Islamic world, you're Arabia, you're Arabia, right? as uh, the, the Islamic families, the Muslim families, who are prolific, they have a birth rate of anywhere between five and seven. Yes. They, you know, and, and, and who are practicing polygamy to, you know, to increase that birth rate. Those families come into Europe and they quickly dominate. They dominate Paris, they dominate Marseille, they dominate Berlin, they dominate Frankfurt, they dominate Munich, they dominate Amsterdam. You know, so you're seeing this, this body come in and really overwhelm Europe. And they will be harnessed by the German, German leadership to create a singular army over Europe. You know, there was a point when Macron was up against Le Pen. And if Le Pen had won the election, Germany was prepared to put troops in France. They were prepared to put troops in France. Wow. And so when you understand how close it was to having the Vichy regime in, in Paris again, it was, you know, I mean, we were right there on the doorstep. And of, so, of course, the French prevented the rise of Le Pen by having a fixed election that put Macron in place. But here you go. And so now you see that in Europe, you will see a singular army for the whole continent, minus Britain. Because Theresa May, of course, who now realizes uh, it, by coming out in support of Brexit that they're going to find themselves all alone with the collapse of the United States. So she's gone absolutely bonkers, in my opinion. She's just nuts. Yes. And this this whole event, this cripple poisoning and, and porting down and everything that's been going on there is just, it's a complete fraud. And it's going to result in, some of those people are probably going to end up in jail, the people that were perpetrating that fraud. If, and if we so, can avoid a war uh, uh, with all of this. But, you know, there's another issue, too, Steve, that goes along with uh, what's happening with the migration, what's happening with uh, this New World German uh, German-led army here in Europe. Uh, we're also looking at the fact that uh, Erdogan, President Erdogan, has not given up on uh, becoming part of uh, the European Union. He was just here in Europe recently again, uh, and that's another great concern, because we're looking at the Gog of Magog, and then of course we have Germany in there to begin with as part of that whole alliance there. We are truly seeing where this because I thought from the beginning that this was nothing but a plot uh, to begin with, to send all the, uh, all the Muslims up into this. Uh, it's mainly Western Europe, not as much as Eastern Europe as you have it in Western Europe. Um, and that, that is being done for a reason. So if he gets into uh, the European Union, they could end up, he could end up becoming uh, a, a very more influential leader that would actually lead a European army nation with him to go against Israel. 
especially yeah. if the United States is weakened down to where they can't defend Israel. Right. Sure. And here you're talking about it. When you think about what that looks like, let's look at the territory here. When you're talking about all of continental Europe, then you're talking about the 57 nations of Islam. You know, that looks conspicuously like uh, uh, Rome at its uh, farthest expanse ever. When you talk about the old, the old Roman Empire at the time of Constantine, that empire completely took all of the continent of Europe and all of northern Africa and, and the Levant. Yes. Except with Islam, it stretches all the way to the Philippines now. And uh, so you would have this recreation of the Holy Roman Empire again, this time the Fourth Reich, in really the largest empire seen in the world. And again, the question would come up, who is like the beast and who can make war with the beast? But that beast, in my opinion, is Islam. The beast is Islam. It's the former Ottoman Empire. And so I do think you will see Erdogan will come and say, look, I want to be part of NATO. But eventually that conversation is going to change. That conversation will change where Erdogan will say, you need to become part of us, not me become part of you. And that's how that conversation will flip. And in the meantime, who will be the only antithesis to that thing will be Russia. That will be the only antithesis out there. And so, again, the impetus remains if a war can be started between America and Russia or America, Russia and China, if that war comes underway, then this beast becomes singularly powerful on the earth, singularly powerful on the earth. And, of course, in that war, there's a very strong chance that you're going to see this catastrophic war between Iran and Saudi Arabia. And I do think that war is coming very quickly as well with the destruction of Edom uh, being at hand, a complete destruction of Edom. And again, so now you're going to see, you'll see something entirely different. The framework here will be completely different as we look into the future here. What's your, what's your take then on uh, President Trump talking about pulling our troops out of Syria? Uh, it seems almost like an abrupt situation. I know the, the Kurds are really nervous uh, if he were to actually pull out. Uh, he's saying that. The State Department is saying that they've not heard any such thing. Uh, of course, that's changing now as more of the President Trump has talked about wanting to leave. But then again, we also see where President Trump is kind of backpedaling just a little bit. I think he wants to leave, uh, but it's almost as if uh, the deep state wants to make sure we do stay there because of a uh, beleaguered economy that we have right now. Well, you know, the truth is, is that 10 days ago, 10 days ago, we suffered a massive defeat in the Middle East when we brought the 6th Fleet and the, and the Roosevelt Carrier Group up with the purposes of confronting Assad with the intent of making Damascus a ruinous heap. And the Russians stood back and said, we don't retreat and we're not going to retreat. And when that happened, we retreated. And when we retreated, that's when the whole game was over. That's when Rex Tillerson was pushed down the road. That's when the game ended. Now, you know, to fully pull out of Syria, what Trump needs to do is, is have our last troops come off the roof of the embassy in Baghdad there in a helicopter, you know, to really give it the old Vietnam goodbye, right? Because we will abandon the Kurds to the same fate that happened to the South Vietnamese. It'll be a very similar condition, a very similar fate. And again, this is what happens when you have immoral people running a military machine that are there to to kill people and destroy things for the purposes of the profit to be able to build more munitions and more war machine to kill more and more innocent people and for no other reason that immorality has a cost and ultimately it's going to come back to cost america in a huge way and so with trump pulling out of syria he's not pulling out of syria because he wants to he's pulling out of syria because he has to and he has to because we simply, I mean, you can't go to the world and say, look, we're, we're borrowing $300 billion from you this month that we're never going to pay back. And we expect to borrow $300 billion from you next month that we're never going to pay back. We currently owe the world about $240 trillion. Worldwide debt is about $4 quadrillion. Worldwide GDP is less than $600 trillion. Excuse me, $60 trillion. And the worldwide debt is $4 quadrillion. I mean, what are you talking about here? You're talking about a world that is completely financially bankrupt. Who is going to loan us $1.5 trillion this year? 
the people that we're in a trade war with in China, the people that we've demonized and want to bomb in Russia. I mean, who's going to loan us this money, right? And why would you loan it to a debtor who has no intention of ever paying it back, ever? So, you know, all of these, these chickens now are coming home to roost, and, and it's a bad sign for the United States. It's a horrible sign. So Trump is going to have to do what he's going to have to do because now he has a peasant invasion, if you will, from Central America. Thousands and thousands of people who have walked, who've left their Central American homes. The gates were open in southern Mexico and said, we're not going to stop you anymore. You want to go to America? Here's the road. We'll give you a police escort. So there's tens of thousands of people that are marching through Mexico right now. And Trump has had to scramble the U.S. military to try to block the border because he doesn't know who's coming. He's got the U.S. military down there and National Guard down there. He has to bring troops home to defend the home front. That's no shock to me. You know, this outreach, when the outreach fails, now they, it's coming back at you. And so instead of doing the things that are right, which is to recreate an economy here, an, an, economic, an economy of of true means and, and something that has a real livelihood for people. We continue to go down this satanic road being led by Lucifer worshipers and child sacrificers to create more and more munitions to kill more and more innocent people. And that whole game is coming to an end. And so the world that's going to change is going to change here very quickly uh, for Americans. And, and I think well, now where Israel is concerned, there is the miracle of the battle of Armageddon, you know, where Yah himself steps in to fight the battle against these, these massive armies. But the question I have for Israel is this, you know, the prophecy in Ezekiel 38 talk, or the Ezekiel 38 talk, or 36 talking about the restoration of the land includes a prophecy that talks about reinstating the Torah. Now, for all of those of you who live in Tel Aviv, tell me you're living under the Torah. Well, you know, that, that brings out probably one of the most provocative things of all, Steve, because when you go back, because you mentioned Ezekiel 36, and if I'm not mistaken, Ezekiel 36 is where uh, Yah is saying to the people, you know, I will not, I do not, do, I do not return you for your sake, but I return you for my name's sake. Which, exactly. Which is so provocative because the famous prayer of Yeshua, when they ask him, how do we pray? He says, pray like this. Uh, you know, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Sanctify your name. You know, and we've been praying this in churches and synagogues, uh, not synagogues as far as Jewish synagogues, but in Messianic synagogues. Uh, this has been prayed for 2,000 years now by believers of Yeshua. And yet at the same time, they have no idea that they're praying about the very prophecy of Ezekiel 36 which is the return of all the tribes of Israel, you know, and in reality, Steve, the, the return is not even so much as returning to a physical land in the Middle East that we call Israel, although that does play a part in it. There's no doubt about it. It's a compound fulfillment, but the true returning is returning back to his word. This is what that returning is all about. This is what, this is the true redemption. And yet at the same time, I'm getting more and more criticism because, you know, I, I can't just sit there and watch my people sit there and, and destroy all the innocents around them and then, and then jump up and down on the bandwagon and say, we should kill all the Palestinians, we should kill the people in Gaza, we should kill all the people in Syria, uh, because this is what God wants us to do. We have to expand our land grab that we're doing here. I mean, you know, Steve... I've got I've seen comments from people that have followed Israeli News Live for, for years now that have come out and said, no, we have to take Syria down because, you know, when the 12 tribes all return, we've got to have a place to live. And I'm like, totally contrary to the word of Yah to begin with. And we're talking about doing something like this. And so more and more, uh, even when this whole issue came up the other day in Gaza, you know, they... Naturally, Hamas, and some people may not like this, but there is a, there is a connection between some very dark circles uh, in, in, I call it the Israeli deep state, and that of Hamas that helps stir, the Hamas stirs up the, 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 the people living in Gaza, as well as 
we on the Israeli side in the government, they're stirring up them in order to create a battle, create a conflict. I mean, why else would you send a hundred snipers out there and just start picking people off because they come to near the fence? You know, uh, <laughs> they come out later and say, well, we killed 10 terrorists. And, but I'm like, what about the other seven that were not? You know, so it's, it's more and more it's concerning me what's happening. And then, there, then we have on top of it, Steve, we have there's channels that are being created out there that are to oppose what we stand for because we're trying to keep a balance here. I can't say that everything that the Israeli government does is truly a, 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 of God. It's not, it's not a, truly of God. I mean, as, as um, who was it? It was um, uh, uh, Zaman, uh, Saman Tov, who was actually here on Israeli News Live, and he said that when the Israeli government paid the gay community to come and hold a gay parade in Jerusalem and promise them protection, he said the sewers for the first time ever in Jerusalem, back, backed up, busted the cover off of the streets. Uh, in fact, it was on one particular street in Israel, and that was Hanavim, which is the street of the prophets. And he said raw sewage went down the streets. He said, do you not think that God was trying to send a message that he was not pleased with what we're doing? And yet, the people are being taught, Steve, that, 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 that Israel has returned home, which I believe, the house of Judah has returned home, um, and that because we are a nation, we, sh we are acting, uh, or nothing else is supposed to be acting on the place of God, and whatever we do is perfectly uh, in, in, in the will of God. And then they've got the people out there pushing this narrative, and the people are just falling for it, Steve, because why? Well, it's an Israeli that's a believer in Yeshua. You know, and it's not just one. They've got many of them out there that are coming out doing this. And I believe that it's just a setup to try to get the people to support the wars, especially the evangelical community, because they're the ones that put Trump in the office. And they need him to be behind any war they need to do, especially a war against Syria. Uh, what's your thoughts on these things? Uh, that's my opinion. Yeah, and I think the, on it. when you talk about the land grab over Bashan, right, in Syria, you know, a lot of that has to do with the Leviathan gas field that's off the coast of Cyprus. If you're going to get that, if you're going to ship that gas into Europe, there's only one route. You, you know, you can say, well, let's put it through Lebanon, but then it has to go through Syria to get to Turkey. Otherwise, it has to go through Syria. Let's put it through Jordan, but then it has to go through Syria. So ultimately, Bashir al-Assad has to agree to a pipeline to transport that gas into the Turkish pipelines to get it into Europe. And... Assad has said, no, we're not going to do it. And the same thing as the Russians have said, no. Now, you also have an issue of the oil fine that's supposedly up there, up there in the Golan Heights, which has another issue as well. What are we going to do there? And the Golan Heights is disputed territory. And you know, what are we going to do? Well, if we smash Syria, we can take more and more turf. And of course, there is, it's, it is on the table to smash Lebanon again. Now, you know, from my point of view, again, you have this idea of war hawks, these idea of, you know, I'm Judah Maccabee, let's go out and conquer some more cities until we can restore the, the, the kingdom to the kingdom of Solomon, the kingdom of David, or whatever, you, whatever people think it may be. The reality is the kingdom is inside of you. You know, what is the kingdom? This question is answered over and over again in the Gospels. What is the kingdom? The kingdom is inside you. And until the hearts of the Israelis are changed, and then, of course, they, not all, all Israelis have the same opinion. You know, I mean, it is widely disparate in the streets of Tel Aviv compared to what it is in the in the restaurants in Haifa, compared to what it is in downtown Jerusalem at the show, right? You have differences of opinion between those people. But nonetheless, the whole of the heart of Israel has to come back to the Torah, not the Talmud. It has to come back to the Torah. And to understand the clarity of the Torah and the teaching of the Torah, one must look to the words of Mashiach, who said, the burden is easy, the yoke is light, who said, you know, this is how you understand the Shabbat. It is lawful to do well in the Shabbat. Man was not created for the Shabbat. The Shabbat was created for man. Stop adding man-made rules and creating this burden that no one can lift, and you won't lift a finger to help them lift it. You know, right. there, all of these things, this clarification of the Torah was given in the Gospels. But, I, you know, I was in the Israeli Supreme Court, and I was talking to the clerk there. And we were sitting in the, in the, in the, court, in the courtroom itself. And I said, well, I want to ask you a question. She said, what's that? I said, can I, if I'm litigating in this courtroom, 
can I raise the Torah as a matter of law? And she said, you absolutely can. Now, I don't know how many Israeli lawyers are raising the Torah, because, of course, the impetus is to raise the Talmud, because in Judaism, there's no distinguishing between the Talmud and, and the Torah, right? You have the pillars of Judaism, which include the oral law, and that's the end of the discussion. But as you're raising, if, if you're going to bring up the, the Mishnah and the Gemara uh, as part of your law, you're adding to what the, the words of Moshe, you're adding to the simplicity right. of the Torah, and most importantly, you're adding to the Chokot of Iyawah. And so this this is something that is not supposed to be done, and it's a misunderstanding. And as a consequence, you do not have a country that is following the Torah. Because look, the LGBT community is called an abomination in the Torah, and it shall not go on among the children of the house of Yasharel. But it does, it does, and 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 there's more than that in Tel Aviv. You know, there's drug trafficking, there's human trafficking, there's uh, there's blood diamonds, right? There's a genocide that's being perpetrated in Southern Africa by uh, the Jewish controllers of the Blood Diamonds that has now had a, has a toll of over 6 million dead people behind these diamonds since 1996. Mm. And so, you know, there is reform. The reform begins in the heart of the people and begins with the heart of the people in Israel just as it does in America. And unless that reform happens, the destruction that is prophesied in, in Zechariah will come upon the land. I mean, it's it's going to be unavoidable. It will come up upon the land. Ultimately, Yah's hand will have his clarity in that region. So when you're talking about Syria, when you're talking about all those other things, uh, you know, try talking. Instead of proclaiming you're the most invulnerable army on earth, and therefore we can do this, we can do that, we can do the other thing. You know, yeah, you can until there's nukes from 50 countries raining down on you. Then, then how invulnerable is your army then? Well, you know, and, and Steve, here's the thing, and this is one reason why I believe that uh, in the situation we're in, no wonder why Yah has to send two witnesses on the scene even before the coming of the Mashiach, because the, the, the whole point is neither, neither uh, Jew nor uh, believer of Yeshua has got their act together. And not to say that there's not some, we know that there is a remnant that believes, but the problem is the majority just don't get it. I mean, look what's happened. I mean, uh, you mentioned earlier the Lutherans and the, uh, the Episcopalians, uh, you know, basically are still Catholic to begin with. So them, them signing in 1999 and, and coming back, Luther coming back into the Catholic Church was no big deal. It's very easy, very, thing, very easy to overcome. When uh, Tony Palmer, though, goes uh, to Kenneth Copeland, which I personally think this had to have been a Jesuit set up to begin with to bring down the evangelicals or to bring the evangelical uh, group back in, uh, that was a very interesting situation because I feel like, Steve, that what happened is we, as 12 tribes of Israel, left Yah, even before the time of Samuel, even before the rejecting, rejecting of Samuel the prophet, which was rejecting as, as, as the Lord said to Samuel, they've not rejected you, but they've rejected me from being king over them. And so what does God do? He comes himself in a body of flesh called the Son of God, and here he is. Now their king is in, in, in human form before them. But the thing is, it wasn't just the house of Judah that rejected Samuel and wanted a king to be over them. It was all 12 tribes. So regardless of where we've been scattered into the earth, whether we're in Russia, Europe, United States, uh, the Middle East, uh, or even Asia, etc., wherever the tribes have been scattered to, uh, we're all in the same boat. And so therefore, I know there's many people that think, well, you know, we're just going to, we're fixing to be raptured up before all this wars come on and stuff like that. And I'm not here to criticize rapture. That's not my point. But my point is, is, what plumb line do we have to say that this is the way of escape and that God is going to take this group here because they are truly following him and there is no issues? You know, I do believe there's a hiding away. It's in the Torah. We can see that, uh, you know, or the Tanakh, I should say. But it's only at God's wrath. It's at Yah's wrath, not at man's wrath. And if that be said, Steve, this is why I believe that the two witnesses are coming to bring a restoration, not only 
uh, for the Jews, for their eyes to come open, the, 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 the house of Judah that does not believe that Yeshua is Messiah to begin with, but also to help open up all the blinded eyes that have been willing to go back to this prostitute system that led us so far away from God. As God said about Ephraim, he said he's, he was ready to redeem Judah, but Ephraim was found with his idols, let him alone. And that were those were the believer those were the those were the house of Israel that were believing Yeshua's message after three hundred years. Next thing they know, they wanted a king again. So what did the so-called Gentiles do, or the other ten tribes, just like the house of Judah that were believing? They put a new king in place. Now, now we have a spiritual king, and that was called a potentate to, to now rule our affairs. So we're, and and then we all these churches, and you know, Steve, I've seen it when uh, I think it's Pope Benedict was elected. You had the Baptist Federation there, the Pentecostal Federation there, the Evangelicals, their groups there. All of them were going down to greet the Pope and wish him a good speed and everything for becoming the Pope of Rome and stuff. And I'm like, every one of them have gone back to this vomit, you know? And so God's got to do something. And this is one reason why I believe that they're returning to the, to the homeland when God says that, you know, not only we see physically we have an Israel there today. Yes, we have the house of Judah that has returned today. Not all of them, but in part, in part they are there as a symbolic fulfillment of scripture. But in reality, the true promised land where all 12 tribes come is not necessarily going to be right at Israel in the modern day state. It will be back to his word and then redemption can come. But as you said, we're looking at a prophecy that's never been fulfilled in Scripture yet, where two-thirds of the Israelites will die uh, as, a, as a result of a war, and then the Mashiach will come. Um, geez, thoughts on these things, Stephen? I know I've kept you a long time, but uh, what's your thoughts here? Well, you know, Stephen, you kind of opened up um, a very interesting can of worms here, and I've been writing on it recently, which is the idea of Moses hoisting the serpent on the spear. Okay, now I believe that that serpent that was on the spear of Moshe was a stabbed serpent. The serpent was pierced. And so Mashiach says, as the serpent was lifted in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted on the pendiculum starosh and on the cross. And you, you have this idea of the serpent being pierced and the son of man being pierced, which gives us back to this prophecy that they will weep, they will mourn over him whom they have pierced. And that particular prophecy, of course, is the big turning point. That's when we see the eyes of Judah open, the eyes of Benjamin, the eyes of, of Levi. That's when those eyes will open and begin to see. That's when those ears will open, they will begin to hear. And this will happen, this is the will of the Ruach HaKodesh, and it's not something mankind is going to do, but it's going to happen in accordance with the perfect will of the Father, that this will take place. And But I do see this as this hoisting of the serpent, and, and who do we see that now it, it sits in the mouth of the serpent? Who sits in the head of the serpent? You know, it's the pontiff, right? Yes. Man's man's king, the one that that you know that uh, that Samuel said they've rejected me. Oh no, we're gonna we've we've rejected Yah, and we're gonna put our guy there, vicarious filio day. We're gonna put him yes. in place of the Son of Man. We're gonna put him in place of the Ben Elohim, and he will govern our affairs. Now this is just basic laziness on the part of human beings. But if you look at the idolatry, you know you shall make no no graven image, right? Go to Rome and tell me there's no graven image there, right? There's, there's no. That's what the painted ceiling's all about, right? And the statue here, the statue there, the engraved doors. I mean, you got engraved images on the doors, on the walls, on the roofs, on the back wall. You got engraved images behind the throne. You got engraved images in front of the throne. The whole building's an engraved image, for heaven's sakes. Make no engraved images except for the following, right? And the list goes on and on. And so here is your frame with its idols, right? And in the United States, it's called a land of idols. I mean, it is a land of idols. We just don't have the statues. We have everything. We've got all kinds of idolatry going on here. And we worship every little thing. And, you know, and ultimately the, the simplification of the Torah, the simplification of the, the easy hand of Yah, what he wrote and what he gave. You know, we were talking about the other day about the temple, right? The command is really for a tent of meeting, right? It's for a tent of meeting. It's 
the temple was the temple commanded or was it allowed you know this 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 stone and timber was it commanded or was it allowed because you, in the Torah command you have the command of the tent of meeting you have the command of the ark you have the command of the menorah you know you have these very simple things these very simple things that are so easy to do so easy to follow you don't need a big budget to do it right and but, so these were the these were the uh, uh, the uh, the uh, mitzvot that were that were handed down in the Torah simple stuff and good stuff and so when we talk about the hearts of the believer you know i would just encourage the people that are listening they said you know the the question is before us is not where to flee or or who to attack the question is how to get right before the father that's the question that's the yes. question you need to ask and that's the question you need to answer absolutely i couldn't have, it couldn't have been said better steve uh, you know, friends, listen, we are in a very, very late hour, and it's no time to play church. It, it really isn't. And uh, we see a, a true move. I mean, practically every denomination has moved away from uh, the true faith of what was laid down with Moses. In fact, if anything, one thing that, uh, in fact, I'm writing this in the book that I'm writing now, I go into the issue of even Samuel the prophet is not where we really left God. We left God with Moses back on Mount Sinai when the true eternal father wanted to come down and have a personal relationship, not just with Moses, but with all the congregation of Israel. We saw a type of that on the day of Pentecost when that same fire that came down, the same God that come down with Moses and the trumpets were sounding you know everybody talks about the trumpets are going to sound in this last day here you know but are the people really ready are they really ready to receive that this is where we really have to go back it's one reason why uh, as the Lord revealed to me recently it has to be Moses as one of the two witnesses because he was the one there that was introducing uh, as you might would say the Messiah so to speak uh, he was introducing the father coming down that wanted to have that intimate relationship with his people, but the people got afraid. And they said, let not God speak, but only through Moses. And so God took the secondary method until he could come in a human body. And this same God is the God that wants to have that relationship with you today. And that's where we have to get back to. That, you know, as Brother Steve said here a moment ago, you know, you are that temple, you know. We're, we're the temple of God. We're the kingdom of God is within you. And uh, we've really got to get to that place there and, and quit thinking that we have to go out and kill everybody on the planet Earth and, and go over, over, overtake these nations. Uh, someone had wrote me recently and said, you know, well, Steve, you know, it wasn't a mandate of, of Joshua through Moses to go and kill the, all the occupants of the land. Well, he was dealing with giants. He's dealing with Raphaim and, and Nephilim and, and the... And the and, but in that case there, he wasn't allowed to take the land from Lot's children either because they had defeated what? The Zamzamim. And their region there, it was, a, it was not normal people that they were going up against. You know, so I think that we really have to take a step back, really look, and not be caught up with propaganda. If anything, pray for those that are giving the propaganda that maybe someone will wake up and recognize what's really going on. This is one reason why I wanted to have Dr. Pigeon come on today because you know he is to me a true historian as well really has a good command of the torah and uh and can help bring some light of who gog of magog is because what we're seeing in the mainstream christianity today they're trying to demonize russia trying to make russia the gog of magog and this is something that has happened more in modern times uh as steve mentioned hal lindsey uh, I think that was in his book, what is it, the late, the late great planet Earth is where basically I think we maybe we get the birth of the Russia being the Gog of Magog uh, war. And that's because there is an agenda, agenda to, to make a certain prophecy fit uh, the narrative so that it would believe, so that, that the people will accept, an, in my opinion, a true Antichrist spirit that they're going to try to introduce to the world. Uh, but anyway, Steve, in closing, any last comments? I just want to thank everybody for watching today. And, uh, and, and again, Steve's with uh, him and Brad Hutkins with the Etzefer group there. 
uh, many others there. Uh, he's actually in Montana where the Sefer is actually, is it printed there, Steve, as well, or, or what else? Not yet. There? It's, it's currently printed in Detroit. Uh, outside of it, actually around Dearborn, Michigan, is where it's printed. Interestingly okay. enough, and but we do warehouse here and we ship from here, and so we have it. We've got a great team out here. The team has really come together, and uh, it's been miraculous, really. Who because we're in the middle of nowhere, you know, and yet the Father continues to bring the right people to us. We're extremely excited. We're working on our Spanish edition right now. Doors may be opening for us to do a Mandarin edition. Those doors may be opening now. We're also working on a Russian edition, and uh, so we have a lot of uh, fuel in the fire. We're publishing, uh, of course, we released Josephus Antiquities uh, last month, and it's really in a beautiful volume, linen wrap, and uh, we're using this Dexter cream paper, and it's a sewn binding. It's a beautiful book, and uh, Antiquities Complete. We're going to be following that with Josephus Wars, which will complete that collection in Josephus. Philo is coming. And, uh, uh, you know, so we continue to advance. We've got um, now a Spanish blog that's available on the, on the website. Uh, my blogs are up, and Brad has a blog. He, he blogs on the mobile app. Uh, the app is becoming, uh, is becoming very effective. Uh, we're very happy with the condition of the app. We're in, a, in another update mode right now, and that update will be coming available probably here at the end of April, which will make the, the, it, it much faster, much cleaner. There were a couple of bugs that happened when when um, Apple introduced the uh, the iPhone 10 or the iPhone X, whatever it's called. There were some bugs in that operating system, so we've had to completely re retool the app, but it's coming. And of course, the INL coupon is still effective for people who want to buy any of the separate products, any of the book products, the the, the tabs, the the covers, etc. All of the things that we can ship from from our warehouse here in Montana are subject to the INL discount code. So anybody who orders and uses the INL code will receive a 10% discount on whatever it is that's, that they're purchasing. The app is outside of that because the app is priced by Google and, and Apple. But the, uh, but the books, that's what the discount applies. And, of course, now the new Zephyr is much smaller. It's only two inches thick now. And we've gone to this Dexter Cream paper, which is very nice to read. We've actually expand, expanded the font. So is it what you would call a large font? You know, it's very close to being a large. It's not a small font, not in any respect. It's very readable by people who have, most people who have fairly challenged vision, you know, between let's call it a 1.5 and a 4.0 in that range. You know, you're going to be, you're going to be very comfortable with this book. If your vision's beyond that, you know, get the app. It'll expand to a 36 point font. But the book itself. I may is, have to get the app. <laughs> <laughs> I just top fours in mine, so I'm in four hundred yeah. plus in both eyes now. So yes. <laughs> yeah. So but, you may need the app, but the app, you know, you put the app on an iPad or on a tablet, and you can bounce that right out to a thirty-six point font, and I mean, it's readable, and it has nightshade with it, and you can highlight, and you can note take, and you know, you and it's got the lexicon built in. The lexicon is also available. But uh, uh, but the book now is much more manageable. It's thinner, it's two pounds lighter, it ships at a less expensive rate. But there's lots of good stuff about what, what's going on. So yeah, we're very happy, and we're, we're so blessed by the group of people that we have working with us right now. I'm I mean, sure a lot of people would be incredibly blessed with these people. That's that's actually you know, I, I, Go ahead, Steve. If I could, if I could tell you just a short story here, Stephen. You know, we had a fire that broke out here in the, in uh, the West Kootenai last summer, big fire, 29,000 acres. And it was raging, this fire. And it burned for, I don't know, a month maybe. And it came within a mile of the of the warehouse. And what we call the Mount one day based upon Jesse's word that the fire was too close. And so all of a sudden they show up here at the warehouse and they've all got their SUVs and stuff. They look packed up the whole warehouse and moved it across the, uh, the the lake here, across the reservoir, and put us in a building across the reservoir for two months until the fire burned out. And then they got, all got together and moved it back. Wow. We never even we we never even asked them. They just did it, you know. And that's amazing. Because that's the community here. That is amazing. That is yeah. amazing. That's a good community to be in, to have the people do yeah. stuff like that. That is amazing. So. 
Anyway, guys, we enjoyed having Steve here today with us. I'm sure you will as well. Uh, just visit uh, www.sefair.net. Uh, and Steve, if you can tell people how they can actually follow your YouTube channel as well. Yeah, the YouTube channel is Sefair Publishing Group. And we have uh, videos up there, a lot of videos explaining, of course, what we're doing in the Sefair. We spend a lot of time, and my blogs are on the Sefair website too, we spend a lot of time talking about the changes that have been made in the Sefer and why they're there and some of the discoveries that we found. And of course, you know, it's like mining a tremendous gold mine, Stephen, when you're working with scripture, you know, you keep digging, it's like, oh, look at this, you know, you more treasure, more treasure, more treasure. Yes. And so we try to share those treasures on the Sefer Publishing Group uh, at the YouTube channel or uh, on the blogs. So either, either place is a great place to go. Excellent. You can also catch us on Facebook and on Twitter and Instagram, I think. Excellent. Far more places than I am. Anyway, blessings to you all for watching today. Thank you, and uh, Baruch Hashem to you all. Bye.